Well, hello and welcome to the introductory lesson for the study of the Gospel of John entitled uh, Jesus the God-Man. I'm Mike Mazzalongo, your instructor. I'm happy that you're taking this class, an in-depth textual study of the uh, book of, uh, of John. So I encourage you, if you have your Bibles, if you're watching this, have your Bibles, I encourage you to open those Bibles to the Gospel of John, uh, chapter one, and we'll be taking a look at that. But before we actually look at the text itself, um, I want to start with a little bit of background, some introductory material about, the, um, about this gospel. Now, the book of John, or the gospel of John, is named after and attributed to John the Apostle, and there is a lot of uh, internal and external uh, evidence to support the idea that he was the uh, author of this book, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time you know, defending the idea that uh, John the Apostle was the writer of this uh, book. Now we do have a good profile of this man, John, from the scripture itself. For example, he was the son of a wealthy fisherman, uh, Zebedee, we know that from Mark chapter one. He had a brother named James, uh, not James the writer of the epistle of James, but another man whose name was uh, James, we know that from Matthew chapter four. Uh, he was close to Jesus, part of his uh, inner circle. He was there at the transfiguration, and it is said that Jesus loved John. Uh, Matthew chapter 17, John chapter uh, 21 mentions these things. He, um, uh, his character, he was a zealous uh, person, he was uh, impatient, he was at times intolerant. Uh, we learn about that in uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 54. Uh, we also find out near the end of the, um, of the Gospel of John that Jesus entrusted uh, Mary, his earthly mother, uh, to John, to John's care. And uh, we also know that uh, John worked with Peter in uh, Jerusalem at the beginning of his ministry. We read about that in Acts chapter three. We also have writers of that particular period, not necessarily inspired writers, but historians of that period. Um, who mentioned John in their particular uh, letters, and that gives us more information historically about John. People like uh, Polycarp, for example, who's the Bishop of Rome, or a Bishop of Ephesus, rather, uh, tells us something about John. It tells us, uh, Polycarp tells us that John made his home, and uh, his work was in Ephesus after the uh, destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD had a great impact on him and a great impact on his writings. From here he wrote uh, this gospel, the Gospel of John, while he was in Ephesus and other epistles around the year 80 uh, AD. He was eventually exiled to the Isle of Patmos by the uh, Roman uh, Emperor Domitian uh, around 94 to 96 AD and from here uh, he wrote the uh, book of Revelation. Uh, we know that John died a natural death at the beginning of the reign of Trajan near the year 100 and eventually was buried in Ephesus. Well, so much about a little, you know, a little bit of background about uh, the author of the gospel itself. Um, I want to move on now to the purpose. Why did John write this particular gospel? After all, we have several gospels. We have four of them. Why, why another one? Well, the reason for that, I suppose, is because um, each writer had a specific purpose for writing his uh, gospel. Uh, Matthew, for example, writes with the Jewish person in mind in order to show that Jesus was truly the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, the Jewish King that they had uh, anticipated from uh, Jewish uh, prophecy. Mark and Luke have Gentiles in mind in order to show that Jesus is the redeemer of nations that uh, the nations uh, longed for. And John wrote when the difference between Jew and Gentile had disappeared. This was after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. And he's writing from Asia Minor when uh, there was a period of false doctrine being uh, preached, uh, doctrine such as Gnosticism challenging the claims of Christianity. And so his purpose is to show Jesus as the Son of God and that salvation is found by having faith in Him and Him alone. So that's his main purpose, the development of faith in Jesus Christ. 
Now, this particular purpose is summarized in John chapter 20, uh, verses 30 and 31. So if you have your Bibles, uh, you can read along or perhaps look at the, uh, at the screen. We've, we're going to throw up that, uh, that uh, passage in a moment. Uh, John chapter 20, beginning in verse 30, John writes, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of uh, the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His, in His name. And so in, John, in, in the entire book of, uh, of John, uh, John uh, develops um, three main themes uh, in his uh, complete gospel. And I want you to think of uh, braiding somebody's hair. You know, when I have uh, two daughters, and I remember when my uh, wife was braiding their hair when they were young girls, you know, take a strand, a second strand, perhaps a third strand, and kind of braid them together into one strand. Well, that's exactly what John is doing here with three uh, trains of thought, if you wish. First of all, the first train, the first strand, is the fact that Jesus is presented as a true man as well as the divine Son of God. So there's one train of thought that John establishes with his record. The second train of thought is uh, the, the evidence that some people began to believe in Jesus. And so he tells stories and, and gives uh, uh, evidence and, and, and uh, uh, describes situations where people actually believe in Jesus and, and how they react to him. So that's the second strand. And then the third strand is the rise of disbelief and rejection uh, of Jesus. And so uh, these themes are not uh, presented in some sort of sequential order in his gospel. It's not as if you've got you know, 10 chapters presenting Jesus as the Son of God, 10 chapters presenting people who believed in Him, and the rest of the chapters uh, showing people who don't believe in Him. Uh, John takes a different approach. He, he weaves all three of these strands in and out in every chapter. Uh, showing Jesus as the, uh, the Son of God, demonstrating that some believe and some disbelieve, all in the same narrative, to make one complete uh, narrative. And so John's gospel describes the object of faith, who is Jesus Christ, and why he should be considered as such, the miracles that he did, the resurrection that he experienced. And then John also describes the development of belief in Jesus and also the rise of disbelief and rejection of Jesus, all in the same narrative, all in the same book. And so when we understand this idea of braiding you know, these three themes, the outline of the book begins to make sense to us. So let's look at the outline of this book, how we're going to study it. The first part of the book is called the prologue. That's what we're going to do tonight. Um, that's chapter one, verses one to 18. In this opening section, John introduces Jesus as the Son of God. The, the, the God-man, if you wish. He traces Jesus' existence uh, from the pre-creation era to His incarnation as a human being. Second part of the book is called Proof of His Divinity Through Ministry. Chapter one, verse 19, all the way to chapter 12, verse 50. Now, this next large section of the book simply braids together the two strands of episodes of belief and disbelief around the description of his ministry. So many chapters describing his ministry and how some people believed and others disbelieved. Accounts of his teaching and miracles, again with alternating responses of faith and lack of faith. The next section um, is the proof of Jesus' divinity through the death, burial, and resurrection. That's chapter 13, 1 all the way to chapter 21, verse 25. So in the final chapters, John uses the same technique of describing alternating responses of belief and disbelief, but this time they are set against the backdrop of his final days as he is arrested and tried and tortured and crucified, buried, and then resurrected. So John's focus was quite narrow in this gospel. Jesus himself, and who he was is presented along with a whole series of believing and unbelieving responses from people around him. And you'll see this theme, you know, if you know it ahead of time, you'll be looking for it as we, as we work our way through chapter by chapter, you'll see that these same themes uh, come up uh, each time. 
All right, so let's begin uh, this study that we're going to, uh, to, to do uh, during this session uh, in chapter one. So let's go to uh, John, the Gospel of John chapter one, and begin our study of the text itself. So we start our study with what is called the prologue because it is not a, a narrative about Jesus' life or His actions, but rather describes Jesus before coming to earth as a human being, which makes John's gospel unique in that sense. None of the other uh, writers uh, you know, describes this period of time. So this is where John is different, as I say. He begins with a statement clearly declaring Jesus' divine nature, whereas the other three uh, gospel writers allow the reader to conclude this from the evidence they present in the gospels. In other words, the other writers, they write about Jesus and his life and what he does and so on and so forth, and, 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 the, and the goal is that the reader will come to a conclusion, wow, then, well, listen, he did miracles, he did this, he resurrected from, from the dead, he must be divine. John turns this around, he starts with a, the statement that Jesus is divine. He begins with that and then he adds the proofs uh, throughout his gospel. So there was a certain concept uh, of the idea of the word, or the idea of the word word or logos uh, in the Greek that existed at that time. Now for the Jews, when, when writers would use the term the word, for them it, it represented the revelation of God. It was something to be understood and put into practice as well as something to be respected. When a writer used the, 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 the concept of the word, the logos, well this was revelation from God. The Gentiles, on the other hand, the Greeks, for them, using that term in, in written form represented the great reason or power or force uh, as we would say today. To be in accord with the word for a Greek at the time or to be in accord with the power was to have a happy and a balanced life. So Jews and Gentiles both used the term the word to mean something very, uh, very specific to their culture and to their thinking. So John in his prologue explains that the full meaning of this concept is revealed through Christ. In other words, He's the Word, He's the Logos, He's the Force. At the same time speaking to Jews and to Gentiles and bringing together their understanding of what this concept meant. So let's start in chapter one, verse one. It says, in the beginnings, and let's stop right there, in the beginning. This refers to the time before creation that dimension that existed before the space-time continuum um, that uh, we live in uh, was created. John takes the reader to that point where one is standing at the beginning of time and not looking forward to history, but rather looking backwards to prehistory, before everything was created, before time was created. So he says, in the beginning was the Word. So the word is a title for Jesus. So that's where we begin, that's where John begins. In the beginning was the word, a title for Jesus. The Jews would see revelation from God. The Gentiles would read a force or a power. The Gentiles would be thinking something different than the Jews were thinking, and yet the concept that both of them were thinking was that the word was something special. So John says, in the beginning was the word. John uses word for Jesus because what you say is a reflection of what's in your heart and what's in your, what's in your mind. And so this opening title for Jesus describes him as being the perfect expression of the mind of God in human form. In other words, when God speaks, when the power is realized, Jesus is what is said. Jesus is what is expressed. Jesus is the force, the power, uh, uh, significant both for Jews and for Gentiles. And then we go on. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Very important idea. Um, not a power coming from God, as in a created thing or an attribute of God. No, Jesus as a person coexisting with God on an equal basis. This is what John is getting at here. 
And then he says, and the word was God. Very significant. The word was God. God was the word. So John, a devout Jew, would never say, and the word was a God. And the reason for that is that uh, this would violate his monotheistic beliefs. To him, this would be idolatry. And so in the first verse, John asks and answers some basic questions here. So to the question, who is the word? John answered, God is the word. And then why is the word God? Why is the word God? John says, because it's eternal before time. It coexists with God. Its nature is divine. So John therefore gives substance to the idea of word or logos far beyond what the Jews or the Gentiles had thought at that time. In the Gospel of John, the word is Almighty God. In the Gospel of John, God expresses Himself as the word. In the Gospel of John, the God and the word are one, one in the same thing. And so in verse two, uh, we read the following. He was in the beginning with God. So once having made the connection between God and the word, John now begins to connect Jesus with the word. He doesn't mention him by name, but he uses a personal pronoun, he, to connect Jesus, who he'll mention by name later, with the word and ultimately to God. So his reasoning is quite mathematical. Let me explain. If A, God, equals B, word, and B, word, equals C, Jesus, then A, God, equals C, Jesus. That's his approach to establishing the idea that God and the word are one, Jesus and the word are one, and so therefore Jesus and God are one. So in the next verse, he's going to complete the equation. Verse three, he says, all things came into being through him and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And so the Jews attributed the creation to the power of God's word. For example, in the book of Genesis, it says, uh, you know, God said, let there be light and light appeared. You know, God literally spoke the creation into existence. Now the Gentiles also saw the power of the force as the agent of creation. So in this verse, John is connecting the word to the person of Jesus, making the word and Jesus one. Now here's the point. The idea is that Jesus, in the form of the word, was the agent of creation. This teaching is also presented by Paul the Apostle in Colossians 1 verse 16. Paul says, for by Him, referring to Jesus, for by Him all things were created, both in the heaven, heavens and on earth. All right, let's keep going, working our way through this passage. It says, in Him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. And so here John makes the bridge from divinity to humanity in three steps. Watch. God is the word in eternity. Number two, the word is Jesus creating the universe. Number three, Jesus is the life bringing light into the world. So John also summarizes Jesus' earthly ministry. He says, Jesus is the life, meaning the essence of God. His life brings light. Light refers to the truth of God. And His word does not disagree with anything true, but reveals the final answer to all questions about God and about salvation. So John briefly explains at the beginning of his gospel what happens at the end of his gospel. In other words, Jesus brings the truth, but the truth is ultimately rejected. Let's keep going, verses six to eight, it says, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might, be, uh, all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. And so in these three verses, John describes the role of one of the major figures in Christ's ministry, and that is John the Baptist. 
He's going to later describe John's work in connection to Jesus, but at this point he simply summarizes John the Baptist's purpose or his ministry. John, he says, was a witness. Now, according to scripture, he was the witness who prepared the people for the coming of Christ, or the coming of the light, or the coming of the truth. The majority of John's ministry was to alert the people that the Messiah was coming. That's what he was there. He, he previewed, if you wish, he introduced the Messiah to the people of that time. In the end, after he baptized Jesus, uh, John the Baptist began to directly point to the Lord as the one who was to come, not just in his preaching, but he'd physically do it. He'd point to him as Jesus was walking by and says, you know, there's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so with his death, most of the disciples of John the Baptist began to follow Jesus. And so that's why John you know, mentions uh, 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 John the Baptist uh, early on in his gospel. He begins before history, he establishes the fact that Jesus and God are one and the same, and then he moves on to John the Baptist, the one who introduced the idea, who introduced the notion, introduced the reality that this Jesus, this God-man, was going to walk among men. So in verse nine, let's keep going, verse nine, it says, there was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came into his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. So in this passage, John reviews and expands on what he mentioned briefly in verse five. Basically, he makes three major points here in these verses. Number one, uh, Jesus brought with him and within him the capability to bring every person into the knowledge of the truth. That's what he means by he brought the light. The light is the truth, the understanding of who God is and what God wants. Jesus brought that understanding with him to earth. Number two, even with this ability, the world which he created, remember at the beginning he says the world was created through him, and so the word made flesh, Jesus comes to earth, brings the light of truth, and yet even with the power to bring the life to truth, uh, 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 the people reject him, John says that. So remember, he's, he's saying at the beginning of his gospel what's going to happen at the end. Despite all of this, there are people that are not going to believe. And then number three, he says the people, the Jews, that he had especially blessed were especially hard-hearted and refused to accept him. And so in verse 12, 13 it says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name, who were born not of blood, nor of will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so this is the gospel in capsule form. In, these, in this few verses here, in these few verses, uh, he doesn't explain everything in detail, but rather he gives a kind of a bird's eye view of what Jesus did accomplish with some people. For those who received, meaning for those who believed Him, He transformed them into spiritual beings. Not created by normal reproductive means, but actually spiritual beings created by the power of God. And so the details are spelled out later in the gospel. For now, He merely summarizes the fact that some rejected Him and some accepted Him, and for those who accepted him, the blessing was that they would become a new creation, something spiritual, something eternal. Now in verse 14, he says, and the word became flesh. Now you see the transformation here? First there's God, then the, God is, then the word is with God, then, then the word is God, and the world is created through the word who is God, now he, he goes the next step. He says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the word becoming flesh is what we refer to as the incarnation. From uh, 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 God being the same as the word, that combination, to the word being the same as Jesus, that combination, to Jesus becoming man, that combination. And that's why we say this series or this, this gospel, the title of it, Jesus the God-Man, because throughout the gospel, John is going to describe this Jesus who is a God-Man. 
So in a few words, John proclaims that Almighty God took on a human body. Now he speaks of his own experience of this, this phenomenon that he witnessed. He says, we, speaking of the apostles, uh, himself, John, he says, we saw, in other words, we experienced this glory. What's the glory? Well, we're in the presence of the God-man, a, a kind of glory that only the Son, only the God-man could actually radiate. And the substance of his glory, in other words, what was it about him that made him glorious? And John says, his godly nature. He was the God-man. He was a man, but the, the, the divinity just you know, poured out of him. Uh, grace and truth, that's the mind of God, clearly expressed. And so he talks about the only begotten uh, from the Father. Now, some never become sons of God, the ones who don't believe. And others become sons by adoption as God forgives and cleanses us from sin and adopts us into His kingdom. We become sons of God through adoption. But here John says, Jesus is a son by nature. He is the only one, that's what only begotten means, He's the only one like that who is related to God by having an identical nature from God. And so John is also reminding his readers of the incredible presence that Jesus had, which makes the rejection of him a terrible, terrible sin. We keep moving through the passage, verse 15, he says, John testified about him and out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. And so in order to reinforce this idea of the impact of Jesus' presence, the gospel writer, he, he reaches back and he talks about John the Baptist's work once again. He says that even John the Baptist, in his uh, witness, testified to the eternal quality and preeminent position of the one who was to, the one who was to come. You know, he says, the one to come was before, and yet, John was conceived before Jesus, but he says that you know, Jesus came before him. He understood this uh, God-man nature of the Messiah. So John the Baptist knew and preached about Jesus' God-man um, um, status. Again, the implication is that their rejection, meaning the Jews especially, their rejection was a grave sin because they had plenty of preparation of His coming from a credible source, John the Baptist. Verse 16, we're almost near the end. He says, for of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. Jesus is the word and the word is divine. And for this reason, the word is completely full. It's full up. You cannot exhaust the supply of truth and grace coming from the word, coming from Jesus, coming from God, all the same thing. You cannot exhaust it. You can't exhaust the truth coming from it. Just like you cannot use up the supply of oxygen by breathing in the open air. Could you actually you know, breathe in enough air to exhaust the amount of air that exists? No. Well, you cannot in the same way exhaust the amount of grace and truth that Jesus, the Word, the God-man has towards sinner who breathe in God's grace and truth through faith in Jesus Christ. So he's making this comparison here. Verse 17, he says, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So Moses received the law which contained the promise of the grace and truth to come in the future, Hebrews chapter 10. And he administered the law given to him by God. But Jesus is the substance of the promise that were only contained in the law. The law contained the promises, but Jesus is the fulfillment of the promises. You know, it's like the difference between having a picture of an item that you've ordered uh, online you know, or something, you just see a picture of it, and then you finally have the product in your hand. You know, one is the promise of the thing to come, a description of it. The other thing is the actual thing itself. So one is promise, Old Testament. One is presence, New Testament. And then finally in verse 18, last verse that we're going to cover in this session, he says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. So no man has ever seen God. You know, even Moses, uh, 
spoke directly and saw the back of God's glory. But Jesus, John says, the God-man gives us an experience of God not available until now. He is able to do this because of his intimate knowledge of God, having the same nature and being part of the Godhead with him. And so Jesus is able to relate to man what he knows about God from firsthand experience as a divine being himself, part of the Godhead. So that's the, those are the first 18, it's quite a bit. You know, we, we've rushed through this, quite a bit of material, a lot of ideas here, fascinating ideas. But let's kind of summarize here what we've, what we've done and then we'll close out this lesson. So John begins his gospel by establishing the fact that with his own eyes, he has experienced God taking on a human nature in order to give man an intimate experience and knowledge of himself. Since we couldn't transfer to his realm, he transferred to our realm. And this knowledge John calls truth or light. This experience he calls life. He says that for the most part, men rejected this knowledge, rejected this experience. But he also lists three witnesses that proclaimed this knowledge and experience, but were not believed. Witness number one, John the Baptist and his witness in preaching. Witness number two, Jesus himself and his witness of miracles and teaching. And witness number three, John the Apostle and his eyewitness of what Jesus said and did. And so with the prologue, John sets up these three braids, if you, if, you, if you wish, these three strands of his gospel. The presence of Jesus, the God-man, the reaction of belief by some, and the reaction of disbelief and rejection by many. And he weaves these three strands together in one single narrative throughout his gospel. And you'll see this come alive as we discuss uh, the Gospel of John in our next lesson. Well, that's it for now. Thank you for uh, uh, staying with us through this uh, challenging uh, first portion. I hope that you'll be back for lesson number two as we continue in the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus the God Man. I'm Mike Mazzalongo and you are watching uh, BibleTalk.tv. See you again. Bye-bye.